J.A.C. Brown says that because some neurosis makes people incompetent at work, we are liable to assume that those without a neurosis would be competent, whereas the truth is that only the, the incompetent neurotic who is seen by the psychiatrist, and since neurosis is socially defined, we ignore the great bulk of brilliant people who are successful precisely because they are neurotic. Kilborn says that it seems ridiculous to many people to give so much weight to advertising. Most people feel that advertising is fun, sexy, often silly, but certainly not anything to take seriously. Almost everyone holds the misguided belief that advertisements don't affect them, don't shape their attitudes, don't help define their dreams. What I hear more than anything else is, I don't pay attention to ads, I just tune them out. They have no effect on me. Of course, I hear this most often from young people wearing Budweiser caps. In truth, we are all influenced by advertising. There is no way to tune out this much information, especially when it is carefully designed to break through the tuning out process. And how right she is. But what I advocate is that you can tune it out, you can block it out, but you can only do that by creatively doing that. You can only do that by knowing it, becoming fully conversant with the way that it works. Then you are really armored up. In Advertising Age magazine we read, A strange world it is in which people spending millions on advertising must do their best to prove that advertising doesn't do very much. Well, uh, Nazi Minister of Propaganda Joseph Goebbels would agree. He said, this is the secret of propaganda. Those who are to be persuaded by it should be completely immersed in the ideas of the propaganda without ever noticing that they're being immersed in it. Ever heard the story of the frog that is boiled and doesn't know it because the heat is turned up so gradually? Incrementalism. Kilborn says that in the 1999 Super Bowl, a Victoria Secret ad paraded bra and panty clad models across a TV screens for more than 30 seconds. One million people turned away from the game to log on to the website promoted in the ad. Of course it doesn't affect anybody. Advertisements say, pleasure to burn. If it feels good, just do it. The energy you crave. Again, always appealing to the death instinct in you, knowing that you're sorely repressed, screaming for vengeance, screaming for justice, screaming to have your way. The pleasure principle doesn't like to be inhibited. And we have to take orders from everyone around us. We have to live in cubes and boxes our whole life. We, we can hardly f form a sentence without being interrupted by other people. How rare it is to even be able to fully you know, express what we think and how rare it is to ever express what we feel. And you think the unconscious mind sits okay with all of that? Of course not. It's going to desperately find ways to uh, exercise all of its frustrations in the way that the great psychologists have said it would. Today we hear about nothing but makeovers, 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 implying that we're not good enough as we are. We find that there's impotency medication advertised during James Bond marathons. Viagra and other sex potency drugs advertised near the period of Valentine's Day. On Sundays when we should be resting and decompressing, we got nothing but sports and war films to keep the energy up, the libido up. Never for a moment should we ever be given pause. And all night long, in the time when your unconscious mind is more dominant, you've got uh, exercise machine infomercials, which are nothing but pornography and under a different name. Advertising, says Bernard McGrave, PhD, is designed to generate an inner sense of conflict with the self. Advertisements say, I'm beginning to get on my nerves. My doctor diagnosed me with heartburn, but I also worry about the other medicine that I was taking, which is not compatible with what he prescribed. Those are typical of various uh, advertising uh, memes that you'll see on television. The whole cult of anxiety. Jean Kilborn says, a cigarette provides a symbol of independence. A pair of designer jeans or sneakers conveys status. The right perfume or beer resolves doubts about femininity or masculinity. And Joel Bacan, referring to the work of the great Freudian Melanie Klein, the work of Klein with children seems to show that from an, from an extremely early stage of development, two emotions arise which have the greatest possible relevance to our later responses to social stimuli and remain very persistent throughout life. These are anxiety and guilt. 
upon both of which propagandists constantly play. The media networks, the television uh, theater, really creates for us what might be described as a new arena. In the time of the Romans, for instance, when you wanted to help people process all their inner corruption, sadism, and violence, you just took them down to the local arena and watched them be torn apart by animals or hacked to pieces by, uh, in gladiatorial spectacles of gore and blood. We have very much the same thing going on through the television. We find that 70% of young adults have a television. 97% of homes have one. The average child watches over 3,000 ads per day. And by the age 20, an average person views over 1 million commercials a year. A viewer witnesses five acts of violence per hour during prime time. And ads take up over two-thirds of newspaper space and 40% of the mail. Almost half the newspapers in the world are published in the United States and Canada. A person can spend three years of their life watching TV. Channel One, these ads on Channel One cost approximately $200,000 for a captive audience of school kids. And that's right. We now don't turn to the human being to have a decent, healthy, realistic conversation. We want uh, the talking heads to tell us all about it. And of course, they're happy to do that. But the way that we're given information through the media, the ubiquitous oracles of the media, the television, is always in this uh, pseudo-democratic, egalitarian way. We'll have the pro and we'll have the con, just as we saw earlier on. We're never going to have an actual individual stand up and take courage and say, you know, here's what we believe. We're going to have this fake uh, dualism. I'm right, you're right, they're right, he's right, she's right. And of course, we always have the uh, illusion that there's a host who's an arbitrator, you know, who's the objective party. But of course, what their job is to do is to subtly steer your particular allegiance. And they do this in a variety of ways. You think it's all objective and you're just hearing the facts. Please realize that a lot of this is all doctored. And this I'm right, you're right, they're right uh, philosophy, it nullifies absolute truth. We no longer want to listen to our own inner innate truth because we're bombarded with so much relative truth. And finally, when those two things start to come together, when we're just bombarded enough and the, the needle hits red, this dialectic continues, the critical mass is reached, and we have no opinions about anything. Finally, it's just like, let go, you know, pop, bang, and we can't make up our own mind anymore. We abdicate our intelligence, our reason. There's too many philosophies. There's too, much, uh, too many nuances. My own truth doesn't matter. And again, who comes in to replace it? the television people's champions who will be happy to replace your own natural intelligence. But the whole problem with that is that uh, we're not being taught what, we're not being told how to think. It's all about what to think. And there's a big, big difference. If you say this is the letter A, okay, this is the letter A, and somebody tells you this is the letter Y, then we take it to be that's the letter Y. But we are never allowed to ask, why is A, A? And why is Y, Y? See, that's critical intelligence. So what to think and how to think are two very different things. And our culture is overwhelmingly orientated towards the what to think. We saw in the program Divination and the Goddess Tradition, this conflict between the doing and the being. And through this advertisement uh, barrage, we are being pushed into a verb, we're being pushed into this whole concept of the doing, overwhelmingly so. We're being focused on the lifestyle and not life. And into the what to think rather than the how. Now, a little earlier we mentioned the fact that, of course, nobody in the advertising business directly is going to admit to any of this. Those who work within the symbolic uh, modes of communication will happily tell you that that rock video couldn't possibly arouse any such criminalistic or uh, sexually deviant um, urges within you. And, and this particular advertisement is just a joke, it's just fun. You have a lot of intelligence, you can turn over, it has no effect. And we talked about her, how that's a complete another uh, fallacy. But we want to also back that up. How exactly do they manipulate context and manipulate words to arrive at the same, uh, to arrive at the result that they want? They're happy to tell us, hey, you're the guy making all the connections, 
hey, if we put this uh, you know, bikini-clad uh, model over here, and we put this phallic uh, beer bottle uh, dripping with ice and water over here, you know, there's nothing sexual about that. Your perverted mind uh, viewer is the one making the association. It's really got nothing to do with us. Now, of course, that's a very obvious example I'm giving you, but there are many. I mean, you don't need to study Sergei Eisenstein and the complexities of editing and montage to understand that there are very, very subtle illusions that can be made and juxtapositions and false allegiances that can be created. And yes, they're right. We are creating it with our minds. But are they off the hook? Can they say, oh, it's all your mind, it's all your own sordid urges that are doing it? Take this word, which is not a word, just four letters, M, G, N, M. What does it mean? It doesn't mean anything until you look at the vowels. M, A, and U. But you see, what actually happened there, when you looked at the original one, was that you already put those vowels in in your mind. I put four letters in front of you, but you knew what it said, because your mind added the A and the U to magnum. So our mind adds the association. And this simple little demonstration, there are so many demonstrations of this, but this simple demonstration shows you how it's done by applied associations. And this is one of the ways that they cop out and say, hey, we've done nothing. It's all in your own head. Throughout the media, we find the perfect family. Of course, the perfect family is more or less based on a masculinistic, uh, patriarchal model. In certain shows, we even see the total absence of the, of the feminine principle altogether. But it's very important to realize that this so-called model family that's painted in perfect colors and perfect uh, lucidity to us on the media is very far from perfect, something that is not really a true model of life. But it works. Lots of people, like an individual, will pick a certain archetype through a stereotype. We are not being introduced at all in this world to our archetypal family within. We're being given external stereotypes instead, and we confuse the two. And then now, as time passes, these family units are still there, but perhaps they're a little darker, a little bit more um, subversive. Because, of course, the mental toxicity is getting a lot worse in our world. And as it gets worse, we're going to need different kinds of models. So the, the unit, the family unit, is becoming a little more sinister, a little bit more dark in order to represent what's going on inside. Kilborn says that today we export a popular culture that promotes escapism, consumerism, violence, and greed. We end up in a world ruled by, in John Maynard Keynes's phrase, the values of the casino. On this deeper level, rampant commercialism undermines our physical and psychological health, our environment, and our civic life, and creates a toxic society. Advertising corrupts us and promotes a disassociative state that exploits trauma and can lead to addiction. To add insult to injury, it then co-ops our attempts at resistance and rebellion. That's right, it appeals to the death instinct also, and to the, these uh, more unhealthy drives because it understands that we're going to rebel. See, it's got the finger on the pulse. And remember, it's the prime perpetrator. So the perpetrator is very clever. It knows exactly what it's robbing and raping us of and then gets ready for the moment of reaction. And then it's ready and waiting again with a new set of bromides and a new set of plausible uh, avenues to experience. Doesn't matter as long as the cash goes into the right pockets. Nietzsche said of the human being, man is the creature who must constantly overcome himself in order to live fully. That's right, he can't just eat and sleep. He has to develop. He knows that there's a calling. He grows. He, he feels a sense of destiny. He feels passion to change things in his life. He has to overcome his own lower nature, all perfectly normal human traits. He wants to develop and get a deeper sense of life and not just be a controlled and narcissistic zombie. But unfortunately, the media know that. These, uh, the power behind these corporations understand this and offer us a myriad surrogate and implausible and fake ways to do it. So that instead of going towards the truth, we go on a much windier and deviant road. Who's leading who? We say the blind lead the blind. But are those leading us really the blind? 
in a room two ad 